Diese Frage des Antisemitismus wird äh, ähm, Thema des ersten Beitrages sein. Äh, ich darf äh, David Bank hier aufs, aufs Podium bitten. Die Frage des Antisemitismus war eine Frage, die schon während der Zeit äh, der NS-Herrschaft äh, viele Menschen beschäftigt hat, insbesondere jene Menschen, die vertrieben wurden und die im Exil lebten. Ähm, David, ba David Bankier wird äh, über die differenten Einschätzungen äh, des Antisemitismus, äh, die äh, von äh, antifaschistischen Exilanten getroffen wurden, sprechen. Äh, der Titel seines Beitrages lautet Anti-Nazi Exilis Reactions to Antisemitism and the Holocaust. Bevor ich ihm äh, bitte mit seinem Beitrag zu beginnen, einige kurze technische äh, Erläuterungen. Wir haben äh, im Laufe dieser Tagung jeweils äh, circa 30 Minuten Beiträge, danach äh, ungefähr gleich viel Zeit für eine äh, Diskussion. Ähm, ich darf Sie äh, bitten, das gilt für das Publikum, aber auch für die äh, Personen am Podium immer ins Mikrofon zu sprechen, da diese Tagung auch äh, aufgezeichnet wird und im Internet äh, zu sehen ist und alles, was nicht äh, sozusagen über das Mikrofon gesprochen wird, äh, taucht äh, dort äh, nicht auf. Ähm, ja, äh, David Bankier wird auf Englisch sprechen. Äh, die äh, Referenten und Referentinnen waren so freundlich äh, auf unsere Anfrage, ob äh, auch Deutsch gesprochen werden kann, zu sagen, ja, sie werden teilweise auf Englisch referieren, teilweise auf Deutsch. In der Disku die Diskussion kann zweisprachig erfolgen, das heißt, sie können Englisch fragen, es gibt deutsche Antworten oder äh, deutsche Fragen, englische Antworten oder alles findet in einer Sprache statt. Ähm, das, äh, ich bedanke mich sehr für die Bereitschaft äh, der englischsprachigen Kolleginnen und Kollegen, das zu tun, weil... Äh, das ist immer mit einer bestimmten Mühe verbunden, aber es ist natürlich sehr publikumsfreundlich und kommt der einer, einer öffentlichen Diskussion hier in Wien doch sehr entgegen. Ich darf David Bankier kurz vorstellen. Professor Bankier ist Inhaber eines Lehrstuhles für Holocaust Studies. Ähm, ähm, am, ähm, an, der, an der Hebrew University und äh, gleichzeitig Leiter des International Institute for Holocaust Research in Yad Vashem. Äh, Bankier hat sich äh, mit dem Thema Antisemitismus äh, sehr lange auseinandergesetzt. Er hat äh, in den 80er Jahren zu diesem Thema auch dissertiert, die Frage des Antisemitismus und die deutsche Gesellschaft. Ähm, es gibt eine lange Publikationsliste, ich möchte nur sozusagen auf äh, äh, jüngste Arbeiten kurz eingehen. Äh, er war in äh, der Liechtenstein in der Kommission äh, zur Fragen des äh, der Vermögenswerte, Kunst, Rüstungsproduktion und äh, er ist Mitherausgeber des äh, Abschlussberichtes der Liechtensteinischen Historikerkommission. Er hat äh, auf Deutsch äh, in jüngster Zeit äh, unter anderem äh, Bücher über die öffentliche Meinung im Hitlerstaat, die Endlösung und die Deutschen, ähm, publiziert als Herausgeber. Er hat zu äh, Fragen äh, des Holocaust äh, auf Deutsch äh, publiziert. Ähm, er ist ähm, äh, Herausgeber einer unlängst erschienenen Publikation, The Jews are coming back, the return of the Jews to their countries, of origin after World War II äh, in New York und Oxford erschienen 2005 und äh, Herausgeber äh, der Arbeit Intelligence and the Holocaust New York 2006 sowie ebenfalls 2006 Jerusalem Karl Jaspers The Guild Question. Ja, äh, ich darf äh, ihn bitten mit seinem Beitrag zu beginnen. But the the Jewish question, 
which does not limit itself to anti-Semitism. And uh, the reason for the minimization of the Jewish predicament in World War II, when compared to the attention given to uh, the suffering of uh, other uh, anti-Nazi segments of European society. And uh, I, I, th I thought that one of the ways of uh, analyzing this was to concentrate not on what was happening in Europe, but what was happening among the governments in exile, in, in London uh, particularly, and among those ex exile groups that did not form governments, like as you know very well, the Germans. There was never a government in exile of the Germans. Neither was there a government in exile of the Austrians. And to what extent was the Jewish question a concern of these groups abroad? Uh, I've been working on this for several years. And here, because of the time limits, I would like to address only two, perhaps, uh, the Social Democrats and the Communists. If I'll have time, I'll also deal with some of the Conservatives. So the question that I'm asking is, what were the reactions of the anti-Nazi exiles to Hitler's anti-Semitic policy? And did the worsening of the situation of the Jews in the Third Reich have an impact on their views on how to solve the Jewish question? Admittedly, the Social Democrats took a strong stand against the discrimination and persecution of Jews. And their publications in exile, time and again, expressed revulsion at Nazi methods. The reports of the Nazi Secret Service, the, the, the Lageberichte I mean here, particularly those of the Gestapo and the SD, testified to the fact that after the Kristallnacht, much of the propaganda and the illegal material smuggled into Germany condemned the anti-Semitic violence. Germany then is Germany and Austria, as you understand. The party's leadership exiled in Prague recognized the sinister implications of Hitler's anti-Semitic policy and instructed its contacts in Germany to collect evidence and furnish the center in Prague with information on the persecution of Jews. At the same time, confronted with the mass exodus of Jews fleeing the Reich, the Social Democrats also raised this question in international platforms. I bring two examples. Uh, Rudolf Breitscheid and Philipp Scheidemann met the Danish Minister of Justice and attempted to enlist his cooperation in removing obstacles to the immigration of German Jews to Denmark. In addition to this, the German Social Democrats also brought up the Jewish question in the consultations that took place in the Second Internationale. Now, I, I, I jump a few years and I get directly to 1942, because 1942 is a watershed when news about the Holocaust became uh, uh, widely known in, in the world. Now, the incontrovertible evidence of the extermination that reached the free world prompted German and Austrian socialist organizations in the United Kingdom, and this includes the SPD, the SAP, the ESK, the Neubeginn, and all, 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 these, all these groups, and what might interest you also, the, the London Bureau der Österreichischen Sozialisten in Großbritannien, led by Oskar Polak and Karl Czernitz, to condemn Nazi atrocities. And this position was also voiced by other socialist organizations in other parts of the world. So this is not limited to, to, to England. England is just a test case. Uh, I, I checked this in other places, and one of them is 17,000 kilometers from, from England, das andere Deutschland, an organization of exiles who found refuge in Montevideo, in, in Buenos Aires. 
So at the end of its <coughs> convention in Montevideo in, in February 1943, this Das Andere Deutschland issued a resolution which declared that anyone found responsible for persecuting the Jews, robbing them of their property and murdering them, be given the death penalty and have his property confiscated. And a similar declaration was issued by the National Conference of the Social Democrats exiled in the United States, which met in New York in July 1943. The conference passed a unanimous revolution, resolution against antisemitism and characterizing the persecution of the Jews as one of the most gruesome chapters in Nazi crimes, demanded all those responsible be punished. The war against Nazism, it affirmed, was not to be separated from the fight against racial hatred, and after the war, it promised to grant full liberty and equality to the Jews of Germany. Now, this, this is the good news. However, if we probe beneath the surface of political statements and engage in a more detailed examination of the theoretical positions in social, socialist publications, and of private correspondence of left-wing exiles, we find that those declarations do not fully capture the position of socialists on the Jewish issue. A case in point was the attitude of Erich Hollenauer, former secretary of the International Socialist Youth Movement and member of the German Social Democratic Party executive exiled in, 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 in England, the Dessau Party. When he's asked in 1941 why German Social Democrats <coughs> did not speak out more against the Nazi extermination of European Jews, Olenauer replied, and I'm quoting, the aims of the Jews and of social democracy <coughs> are not identical. This view seemed to have been representative of the general stand of socialists who minimized the importance of antisemitism and failed to recognize the full signific significance of the Nazi threat to the Jews. It seems that for socialist exiles, the struggle against antisemitism played a minor role, and apart from a moral duty to defend the Jews, it was a defense against Nazism as a system that employs slogans such as Jewish world conspiracy or Jewish Bolshevism to enslave others. Now, the left had traditionally belittled Jew hatred as a phenomenon connected with the economic interest of the bourgeoisie and the reactionary sectors of society who made demagogic use of anti-Jewish feelings to distract the masses. The variety of Nazi antisemitism was no different and therefore also perceived as an instrument of oppression in, Nazi, in, in Hitler's hands. This reductionist or essentialist approach generated an explanatory model that tended to underline the lack of uniqueness in the Jewish plight. Since the tribulations of the Jews were not a specific problem to be separated from the repression of other groups which were persecuted by the Nazis, they asked the Jews not <coughs> to emphasize their tragedy. Official party literature as well as left-wing intellectuals continuously emphasized that the Jewish question was a secondary issue which received more attention than it rightfully deserved. And this is during the 30s when the persecution uh, was the, the policy of the Nazis and this is during the 40s when the extermination was the policy of the Nazis. These feelings shed light, for example, I'm just bringing a couple of examples, on, on, on Anna Zegers, the famous writer. She refused to be included in an anthology of Jewish authors banned by the regime, and Franz Schonauer's uh, uh, assertion that the abundance of Jews writing in the exile publication Die Sammlung created an erroneous impression that all exiles were Jews. I mean, this feeling, it's too Jewish. Some social democrats developed an argument that Hitler's anti-Jewish policy was a consequence of the incitement of a regime that was unable to fulfill its promises and extricate itself from economic difficulties. Others reasoned 
that it was bolstered by the internal conflict within party circles who were unable to govern. However diverse their interpretations, it is nonetheless clear that they all ignored anti-Semitism as an issue in its own right. Believing that Nazism covered behind the facade of anti-Semitism its true intentions, the destruction of all free institutions, this is what they believe, this is the aim of Nazis, the socialists emphasized the need to fight anti-Semitism, not because it was related to Jew hatred, but because they saw it being used as a means to strengthen the dictatorial system. This spurhead theory of antisemitism, as, as well known, uh, developed or believed by, by Franz Neumann, helped the Zeitschrift für Sozialismus, this is the, let's say, the, the, maga, the journal of the intellectuals among, the, in, among the, the left exiles, to write that the persecution of the Jews was merely a vehicle to accelerate the process of enslavement and, and an instrument to pave the way to discriminate other opponents of the Nazi regime. The removal of the Jews from the economy and the process of Aryanization were also expressed, explained on the basis of the same scheme. It was functional to eliminate the Jews, to generate jobs for party members, and clear the way to grant employment to other sectors, thus making them dependent on the goodwill of the Nazi system. And this is, for example, the analysis of Otto Bauer, well known to this audience, when he, on, in, when he writes in the Sozialistische Kampf in, in June 1938, emphasizing the functional value of anti-Semitism. And he understood the Aryanization policy as a means to relieve civil servants, lawyers, and doctors from competition and create a new bourgeois class which owes its existence to the Nazi regime. Now, coupled with this explanation of the functionality of antisemitism for Hitler's domestic needs, the socialist press also highlighted its manipulation in Hitler's foreign policy. In the Nazis' effort, to undermine countries that oppose them, they incited their populations with anti-Semitic propaganda. Drawing upon this model, the emigres also interpreted the promulgation of racial laws in Italy. So this is not something that is unique to Nazi Germany. This is why Mussolini uh, issued these laws in, in 1938. What's the reason? The search for a way out from Italy's economic difficulties and to cover up its failures in foreign policy. All this led Mussolini to look for a scapegoat to divert public opinion against it. Now, coming to another topic, still related. It is important to emphasize that denunciations of Nazi antisemitism, as I have shown, exist and expressions of sympathy to the Jewish victims as exist. Doesn't mean that socialists were not susceptible to stereotypes on Jews and Judaism. Many socialists consistently rejected Jewish collective existence and advanced the common argument that the Jews, being a product of capitalism, had no future. This forecast was accompanied by vilifying stereotypes of the Jewish character. And uh, when, when you read all these uh, tens of, of, of magazines and journals and periodicals that appeared, in the, especially in the 30s in Prague, in Paris, in, in, in Stockholm, uh, you, you see there are issues that devote uh, full pages on who are the Jews and why the Jews and, and so on. Uh, and I'm summarizing more, more, more or less the discussion. Um, this forecast that the Jews, being a product of capitalism, have no, <coughs> have no future, this forecast was accompanied uh, by, by all these stereotypes, as I say. One writer, for example, argued that despite the removal of the walls of the medieval ghettos, the Jews were still chained by obsolete social institutions to a mental ghetto. The Jews displayed an ostentatious behavior. They believe in Jewish chosenness, preserved uncivilized customs, 
such as circumcision, dietary laws, and observing the Sabbath. Their archaic conduct was an affront to social manners, which would have disappeared for the sake of Jewish assimilation. Of all the charges, none is so striking as the one impregnated with the language from the anti-Semites lexicon, which went as far as to say that Jewish exclusiveness was so strong that even after marriage, the Feudum imprints its stamp on the non-Jewish spouse more than the Verdeutschung on, on the Jewish one, which means we are li this, uh, people are a product of their times, and it doesn't really matter if they are socialists or not socialists. These are the images that circulated in those years, and even when they expressed sympathy for the Jews, even if they condemned the Nazi atrocities, still the image of what is a Jew is very much entrenched in, in, in their mind, as it was seen in, in, in the 30s. And uh, I believe that although these views should not be overemphasized, uh, they certainly indicate that statements against anti-Semitism were one thing and relinquishing prejudices quite another. Uh, das Andere Deutschland, this periodical that is edited there in, uh, in Argentina, and, and, uh, constantly criticized the alleged Jewish isolationism. It says that in, in immigrating to new countries, the Jews immediately established their religious and cultural institutions and devote themselves to the needs and advancements of Jewish interests alone. The newspapers, it continues, focus on the Jewish people's credit list, <coughs> turning a necessity into a virtue. Hence, it insinuated the Jews themselves were partly responsible for Jew hatred because in emphasizing their Jewishness, they indirectly justified anti-Semitism. A similar behind-the-scenes prejudice might explain the frequent criticism of German Jews' search for new patterns of life in the new reality imposed by the Third Reich. The main target of the attacks was the Kulturbund, which was seen as a factual testimony that the Jews merely wish to conform to the Nazi system and live in a comfortable ghetto. Needless to say that these attitudes help to account for the unfriendliness of many socialist enemies <coughs> to a Zionist solution to the Jewish problem. They asserted that not only was Zionism doomed to fail because it was linked to British imperialism and was opposed by the Arab national movement, it was destined to bankruptcy because the aspirations of Jewish national and cultural, revi and cultural revival were altogether negative. First, because the promotion of an inferior culture would block the way of future generations of Jews to enjoy European cultures. Second, because Jewish culture was valueless, merely an artificial creature born in a community of suffering, an enlightenment. Hence, the end of Jewish suffering would also put an end to its byproduct. We should not get the false impression, though, that all socialist exiles advocated assimilation as the only solution to the Jewish question. And a remarkable example, and I think it's the only one, uh, is Willy Brandt, a member of the Internationale Gruppe Demokratische Sozialisten exiled in Sweden, who had a favorable attitude into the rebuilding of Palestine by the Zionists. And by the way, as you very well know also, Bruno Kreisky was also a member of, 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 that, of that group, but Bruno Kreisky did not share this view of, uh, of uh, Willy Brandt, um, who already in April 1944 supported the, the establishment of uh, uh, a Jewish state in Palestine, part of Palestine. And another exception was the Deutsche Volkssozialistische Bewegung, which having detached itself from the marx kautsky heritage, did not ignore the national factor and adopted a different stand from mainstream German socialism. Hans Jäger, one of the leaders of the movement, summarized its attitude several times in 1938 and 1939. 
He suggested that the problem be solved within the framework of federation of nations to constitute the basis of Europe after Hitler. Those Jews who wanted to would be protected under the law of minorities, while the rest would have to assimilate. Yet he concurred with the view that too many Jews were intellectuals and therefore advised the Jews to undergo vocational training to solve the problem of the absence of Jewish proletarians. So again, it gives you the, the images that circulated at the time. <laughs> the place of Jews in the leadership of the socialist parties was another issue which elicited severe reproach. The Jews complained one of the participants in the debate over this topic had demands for leadership because of what? Because of their intellectual arrogance. And another writer expressed a viewpoint which was permeated with the same images. The Jews, he affirmed, have a special facility for journalism and psychology. They are endowed with imitating ability like artists. They have an abstract thinking and lack feeling of sentimental values. Consequently, the socialist theory being formulated by Jewish intellectuals could not be understood by the proletarians and this led to the alienation of the working class and generated hostility towards the Jewish intellectuals. Now all of you who are acquainted with socialist history of the, of the 20s know how popular these views were, were, were then. And, it, and what I'm trying to point out that despite the persecution, uh, these views did not change. It does not matter that these Jews in the 30s were persecuted and the 40s were exterminated. These conceptions that the Jews lead the, 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 the party and, and they are, they're, they're hyper sophisticated and in, in, in their Talmudic sophistry of, of analyzing Marx, they make the doctrine incomprehensible to the masses. This remained there, stuck as, 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 as views that do not change. And why is it important? I think that, that uh, the fact that socialists um, were not immune to these stereotypes helps to account for the lack of awareness of the uniqueness of the Jewish plight under the Nazis. Now, uh, let me move towards the uh, um, communists. How long do What is enough? <laughs> Fifteen. Oh, okay. Huh? Oh, okay. Well, as it is known, the communists did not. Uh, the communists are an, an interesting case because uh, it's it's different than what you have ex what you would have expected. As it is known, the communists did not pay much attention to anti-Semitism, which was seen under the general category of class struggle. And then, the, uh, however, 1935 this position began, began to change. Though the theoretical assumptions regarding the Jewish question were not abandoned, the political tactic accommodated to the re resolutions adopted by the Comintern 7 Congress in August 1935, which called for an establishment of a popular front against Nazism. And this change sets the background to the communists' greater concern with the persecution of Jews under Hitler. Condemnation of anti-Semitism, which is all over in the communist writings, does not imply acceptance of Jewish particularism, naturally. The communists continued opposing the ideological and social basis of Jewish ethnic identity and attacked Zionism as a reactionary utopia allied to the Nazis. And of the many examples, it suffice to bring one. Uh, one uh, in 1934, uh, one of the communist journals claimed that Zionism was the only legal party in the Third Reich because of its ideological affinity with Nazism, that Martin Buber maintained that there was a spiritual kinship of both movements, mm -hmm. that the Jewish weekly, Zionist weekly, the Jewish Rundschau, had hailed Hitler's assumption of power and that the Jewish poet Bialik had praised Hitler as the new Cyrus in Jewish history, and all this attitude, uh, uh, was, the, the author says, was not typical only of German Jews. The Jewish bourgeoisies in Austria and in France and in Poland also support fascism. Given this background, uh, 
what's surprising is the development that takes place in 1943. And uh, this uh, uh, development um, was uh, seen by historians, by Fritz Pohl, I believe, was the first one who noticed this change. He's an historian from Hamburg, from the Institute, for, uh, from the uh, Exilstelle, in, in, and by, by Jeffrey Herf in America, and Angelica Tim, who now is in Barilan, I believe. And they have noted the unique reactions to the Holocaust by Paul Merker, Paul Merker, the ideological and political leader of the German-speaking communist exiles in Mexico, which is summarized in their organ, uh, Freies Deutschland. And now this, or, this organization, Freies Deutschland, doesn't have only, only the Germans. It has communists from all over Europe. You have Theodor Balk, who was a Yugoslav communist. <coughs> Bruno Frey, who is very well known to you. This is Benedikt Freistadt, originally yes. Slovak but adopted uh, by, by, by the Austrians. Uh, and uh, Leo Katz, who was a Comintern agent and member of the Central Executive Committee of the, of the German Communist Party then in Mexico. Otto Katz, uh, some of these guys later on were hanged during the Slansky trials. It's a, it's a complicated story. Um, but this change that uh, appears in the writings of, of Merkel uh, that, that uh, has a more positive uh, attitude towards the uh, compensation of Jews after the war and so on, is uh, attributed to the personality of, of Paul Melka, that they see an exceptional case that uh, the, the demands that Merkel makes in 1943 for, for to, comp to compensate the Jews and to uh, to see the specificity in the Jewish persecution, they attribute it to this, the unique case of Paul Melke, whereas the rest of the, the, the communists did not uh, share this view. And I think that this explanation is wrong. Uh, I believe that the examination of all the exiled communist literature from 1941 <coughs> onwards shows a fundamental shift. Anticipations of the change become apparent in various communist journals, in the Welt published in Sweden, in Young Czechoslovakia, and Einheit, edited by German communists of the Sudetenland in London. And this new approach is striking because of three main reasons. First, the communist emigres urged collaboration with Jewish reactionary sectors. They called all Jews, Zionist, Orthodox, assimilationist, to set up a united anti-Nazi front. Second, these communist publications alluded to a specific fate of the Jews under Nazi occupation. And they praised the heroism of Jews who fought in the, in the ranks of the partisans and lauded the Jewish contribution to the progressive camp and the socialist movement. And third, the communists, in sharp contradiction to the official line at the time, referred to the uniqueness of the Jewish ordeal, admitting that the Jews were enduring ill treatment on, an, on another level entirely. For example, in 1943, they write that uh, they distinguish between Jewish and non-Jewish victims in the Soviet Union. Whereas the Russians are enslaved, the Jews are exterminated. Uh, this uh, change is also in 1942. It can be uh, checked in the, public, in the communist publications in, in, in London. And uh, it's either communist or fellow travelers who participate in the official memorials of the British Jewish community and laud in, in their addresses the contribution of the Jews to the Red Army and even start speaking about the need to, and the duty to compensate the Jews in a free Germany. This will be done by a revocation of the anti-Semitic laws, rebuilding of destroyed synagogues, and restitution of Jewish communal property, and reconstruction of Jewish life. Uh, it said that the Jews have the right to set up their cultural, national, or religious institution. More important, this Freie Deutschland Bewegung went even further and expressed 
their support for an international solution for the establishment of a Jewish national state. And we are here, remember always the chronological setting, we are here in 1943. This is much earlier than the so-called surprise that Gromyko made to the world in, in May 1947 when he expressed the support of the Soviet Union to the establishment of a state in Palestine. Uh, in November 42, and, and this is the Freie Deutschland Bewegung in London, they declared their understanding, and I'm quoting here, that the persecution had strengthened the Jewish national consciousness, and therefore the Jews had the right to establish their national and religious institutions to represent their interests. Furthermore, it added, the free German support with sympathy the endeavors of part of the Jews to establish their own national state. Naturally, the other part will have to assimilate if they want to. But if part of the Jews want to go to Palestine, so this will be supported by the communist uh, uh, Freie Deutschland Bewegung. This uh, appears also in the writings of the uh, Czechos uh, Czechoslovak uh, uh, publication, communist publications. Assimilation was obviously seen as the optimal solution to solve conclusively the Jewish question. Those Jews who would consider themselves Germans or Hungarians would be recognized as such, and their condition equalized to the status of Germans and Hungarian minorities. However, Another possibility is also accepted, Jews as a national minority. Those of Jewish origins, in the case of Czechoslovakia, for example, who would see themselves as members of a Jewish nation <coughs> would be granted minority right. The interesting fact is that this novel approach, which recognized the possibility and the legitimacy of a solution to the Jewish question, not through assimilation, but rather in form of a national existence, either as minorities in Europe, or, in, uh, in the, or giving legitimacy uh, to, to uh, Zionism, um, is as early as I say as 1942 and 1943. And it is important to emphasize that this stand is not, but is by no means atypical so it's not only Paul Merkel who decided to deviate from the official line and start writing as he writes, but because it was reaffirmed in the resolutions of the Continental Conference of Free Germans in 1943 and often repeated in the declarations of other organizations of free Germans, both in Latin America and in, and in England. Merkel's position on the future solution of the Jewish question can be summarized in the recognition of and support for the demands of the Zionist movement to establish a Jewish state in Palestine and the obligation of the new Germany to help them to do so. Uh, how do we explain this? And this is in five minutes or even less that, that, that I can try to do it. Uh, I, I, there is no doubt that uh, ideologically uh, communism re uh, remained anti-Zionist. There is no doubt about it. But Pragmatically, Stalin understood that uh, it would serve his interest. Uh, Stalin always was much more afraid of, of Churchill than of, of, of Hitler. And it would serve his interest to, uh, um, to destabilize the Middle East. And in his views, the creation of a, of a, a community of Jews would serve eventually the, the Soviet interests. And this is why, although Zionism remained uh, taboo and, and, uh, and, uh, and negative, the solution of creating a base for Jews that would uh, serve the Stalin's interests in the Middle East was seen as something positive. And this is why I believe uh, these uh, positions uh, uh, appeared in, in, uh, in, in the West. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the... The, the, the smoking gun. I do not have that document will say, I order uh, to do this. So when these people went to the, to the consulate or, the, co or, or the, the, the embassy of the Soviet Union in Mexico or in London or, uh, or in Stockholm or whatever, and they got the instructions on how to refer to the Zionist question and how to express themselves, 
uh, this, this document doesn't exist. But it's only through the circumstantial evidence that too many references in a positive way <coughs> that support the creation of a, 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 a Jewish state in, uh, in, in Palestine uh, appear at this time that I can only attribute it not to a deviation from this line that Moscow set, but to the contrary as a following the line that, uh, uh, that was set by Stalin in Moscow. Uh, the rest of the open uh, sources are well known. This is also reflected in the conversations that Weizmann and, and Ben Gurion are having with Soviet delegates. This is reflected in the visit that uh, the ambassador in London, Maisky, when he went to, uh, he passed through Palestine at the time and he stopped in, 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 uh, in uh, Malia Hamisha, in one of the kibbutzim near, uh, near Jerusalem. He also had their conversations with representatives of the, of the Jewish trade unions. So all these are known, known facts. And what I try to do here is to see how this is reflected in the declarations of the anti-Nazi exiles as well. Thank you very much. But um, did you see any differences or variations regarding intellectuals and uh, writers in exile? Uh, because uh, they also discussed uh, this issue, but it was not officially uh, party line and so on. The, shall I answer a question by question? Uh, you know, there is a huge amount of the so-called exil literature. Most of the exil literature actually deals with what you mentioned, the individual writers, playwrights, uh, intellectuals who found refuge in, uh, in mainly in America, but also in other countries. And, uh, and then what... what, what uh, I ask myself is, how do I make sense of individual expressions? I mean, can I create a pattern? Can I create a model of, 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 of analysis when, when uh, Heinrich Mann says this, and then his, uh, his brother in Pasadena says that, and then, his, uh, uh, and then Klaus Mann says this, and, and then Erich Maria Remarque says that, and it's and then what, what, what's the weight of all this? What's the weight of all this? So the, the, it, first of all, it would become a very difficult task to do. And then you would say, OK, so no, now go into a textual analysis of their writings. Yeah, start, start analyzing the literary uh, production of, of these people, what they write in exile and the image of the Jew in this. So I must confess, this is not my, my cup of tea. I'm not a literary historian. Uh, you know, the fingerspits, you need, you, need, you need to find, you need a certain specific uh, taste, and which I don't have to find the, 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 you need the, the, to work on this sort of material. And this is why I decided to work on politics, not on intellectuals on individuals, but to work on political organizations and institutions, but not only, as you noticed, on the official declaration, because I will find nothing, nothing interesting in the official declaration, although even then you can find some stuff, but all, on the non-official declarations and on the, non, uh, and on the <coughs> things that refer to the Jewish question or do not refer to the Jewish question unofficially. I'll give you an example. This union of, 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 of socialist parties had its meetings in, uh, in, in London. And uh, every time uh, that they bring a guest lecturer, 
And this guest lecture re refers on something which is, which is important uh, for, for the period. And after the, the guest lecture leaves, there, there is, as you know, you do now, questions and answers. And there is a discussion on, on, uh, on the topic that was addressed by this, by the, by this guest lecture. So in April 1944, a guest lecturer is somebody that is the representative of the Bund in London. April 1944 is the first anniversary for the uprising of the, of the Warsaw Ghetto. So comes this Scherer, who at the time, you know that Ziegelboim committed suicide. So Scherer, Immanuel Scherer is now the representative of the Bund in London and he gives us, he explains what was the uprising of the, of, of the, of the Warsaw Ghetto. And having finished the, the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto story and so on, the, the person who, who, who runs this meeting says, any questions? No questions. Thank you very much. And everybody <laughs> this, this This is amazing. This is amazing. Because how come no one was interested in 1944 just to ask informative questions? I don't want to here sophisticated analysis, but informative question. Bec there was something very problematic in the attitude of these people in London and the Jewish issue. So much so that they, they preferred to, to marginalize this topic, not, not to refer to it. So I say it's not only the official declaration. The official declaration of the Union in December 1942 says we are appalled uh, for what uh, um, Hitler does and the extermination and so on. And after being appalled, that's it, no more. No more references of the Union of Socialist Parties to the extermination of the Jews till 8th of May 1945. I mean, to the end of the war, afterwards, no. It, it's not an issue, it's not a topic. And when the issue is forced upon them, sort of speaking, by a conference brought by the representative of the Bund, it doesn't awaken it. So there is some sort of psychological block. And this is what I prefer to do. Not to work with individuals, which and then I have to go into a psychological analysis, why do they have this block? But to work with institutions that create this block, with, with, with organizations that create this block, and try to explain. Okay. I think what you mentioned on the uh, ideas and propaganda of German communists on compensation uh, must just be left out by Austrian communists. Because if you look at the policy of the Communist Party in Austria after the liberation, they were first strongly against uh, restitution measures. Uh, they were uh, Communists, as well as the other parties, uh, didn't think it necessary to support <coughs> Jewish survivors until the beginning of 46. And third, uh, the Austrian communists uh, joined ranks with anti-Semitic demonstration against displaced persons in Upper Austria. So therefore, the founders of the Austrian Communist Party uh, survived in Moscow. They came directly from the center of the communist uh, international. And do you have any ideas why, why there is such a difference between the German attitude and the Austrian attitude? Yeah, but you gave already the answer. This is forced liberation. You see, we have to be very careful in the chronology of these events. Uh, Bruno Frey, you know, he, he's extremely anti-Jewish in his, in, in his writing, in, in his, I mean, against Jewish institutions, against the Jewish religion, against anything that is Judaism and so on. What does he do in Mexico? He joins the Jewish community. And when, when, and, uh, when, when you have, uh, when you have to analyze what happened here, uh, you, it's, it's a flirt, and the flirt is mutual. The communists flirt with the Jews and the Jews flirt with the communists in the 40s. The communists flirt with the Jews because they want the Jews, they believe that the Jews have power and they can influence Roosevelt to open the Second Front. And, uh, and this is why they send 
uh, the, the uh, Pfeffer and Michoels to the West to mobilize the Jewish organizations and to, to, to canvas to collect, to collect money for, 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 the, for the Soviet Union needs and uh, especially for political purposes. So this is the interest of, of the communists. Get to the Jews, go to the Jewish communities, forget that they are reactionaries, forget that they are orthodox, forget that we don't share their views, but we need them now for the interests of the Soviet Union. This is the pragmatic line of Stalin, and this is very comprehensible, period. The Jews are flirting with the communists for their own reasons. So if you ask me, <coughs> what's the interest of, of Ben Gurion in, in, in meeting these people, or what's the interest of Weizmann? It's, it's obvious. The Soviet Union is a world power, and whatever can serve the interest of the, of the Zionist or, or organization, to, to help them establish a Jewish state in Palestine is, uh, is, uh, will, uh, will be exploited. When you read the, the, the internal discussions in the, in the Zionist organization of the United States, should we be the first that received a communist delegation in 1943 to, to, to New York? Should the Jews, I mean, for, from the point of view of image, of public image, should the Jews be the first to receive this, this communist delegation? Uh, and so you have two views. You have the views on the one hand uh, of people who are totally opposed. It. This, is, this creates a bad name for the Jews. This, this strengthens this image of the, you know, the Jido Comuna in, in its American, American form. And you have the view of, of Goldman, you have the view of, of Stephen Weiss, and says we should because this is, the, this is what we need. We need the support of Stalin in the creation of, 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 uh, of a Jewish state. So all talks of compensation, what will happen after the war, has to be seen in the context of when these talks are, 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 are made. Uh, all, 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 all declarations have to be seen in the context. When are these declarations made? If the communists want to polemicize with the social democrats, the social democrats don't want to give any compensation. When you read uh, and, uh, the, 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 the protocols and uh, when you read the drafts, then you can see that one writes, and then after the war, we are going to compensate the, the Jews for, what, for whatever, and then strike out, and uh, this, this, uh, the official declaration does not include this. Someone dared to raise it in, 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 in when the draft was being formulated, that we are going to compensate the Jews. And, and then somebody else says, well, you're talking nonsense. We're not com going to compensate anybody. And this is, this, this is, this is deleted from the, from the final text. When the communists want to polemicize with the, with the socialists and show the Jews that they are different, they emphasize. They say that they we are not going to compensate you. We say that we are going to compensate you. But all this is uh, in the flirt, in the mutual flirt, political flirt, that is uh, developed between Jews and, uh, and the communists, and communists and Jews in the years 1942, 1943, 1944. 45 to a certain extent. What happens after the liberation? After the liberation is a new story. Then life, life begins uh, 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 with, with other needs. There is no more need to mobilize the, the Jewish communities for Stalin. There is no more need to, to create a second front. There is no more, more need to help the Soviet Union get arms via, via the, 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 the Arctic and, uh, and, and Jews pressing Roosevelt to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to do this policy. So what happened after 45 is a totally different story. But what concerned me is this fantastic change that takes place in, in, in 42, 43, 44, which is rather, uh, rather unknown. And, and partly it is unknown because during the Cold War, the, not only they, I mean the communists, have a biased historiography. In the West, there is also a biased historiography. So in the West, there was also a tendency to minimize what did the communists do, uh, 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 let's say, for uh, the, the benefit of, 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 of uh, the Zionists or, or the Jews during the war. Uh, but again, this would be another story.
Weil das glaube ich böse, ich bin nicht ganz einverstanden, aber vielleicht können wir später noch drauf zurückkommen und schauen, ob das geht. Ja, aber weil ich auch, also ich looking at flyers and, and, and newspapers of the Ostern Communist Resistance. Uh, <laughs> if you just talk to me. Uh, the, if I just look at the propaganda material of the Communist Resistance in Austria, there was just one group, one single group, are taking position against the persecution of the Jews, and that was the group around the architect uh, Echholzer. All the others didn't mention it with a single word. So I think there is perhaps in the case of Austria something a little bit different, but that's another, and I think, quite a long discussion. No, again, no, I want to clarify this in order not to be misunderstood. We have to here divide, distinguish carefully between what happens in the Soviet Union what happens in occupied Europe, what happens in, in, in the free West, okay? In the Soviet Union, all what I'm saying doesn't exist. This is absolutely obvious. You will not find a single reference of a positive attitude towards Zionism in the Soviet Union because Stalin does not need to mobilize the Jewish community for, for his purposes in the Soviet Union. What you'll have in the Soviet Union is a relaxation in the persecution of expressions of, of, of <laughs> national, let's say, uh, national feelings. But it, does, it doesn't do it with the Jews only. It, it does it also with, with the Orthodox Church. And, and, and this is why when you read Einigkeit, the, 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 the organ of the anti Jewish anti-fascist committee, they, they allow them to use terms like uh, Netzach Israel, for those of you who understand Hebrew, I mean the, 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 the eternity of, 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 of the people of Israel. And that's it, not more than that. It, it's not true that the extermination is not mentioned. This is a defamation of the Soviet Union by Western historiography. The, the extermination is mentioned with the limitations of what happens in the Soviet Union. They are not, they don't mention it, let's put it, uh, less than the, than the, uh, than the, 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 the French, the, the French do it with their, with their uh, uh, Jacobinish con conception of, of, of equality. You don't have to single out yourself. So this is the Soviet Union. Occupied Europe is a totally different story again. You don't express uh, uh, these things because they, they concern nobody. What I was talking here is manipulation, political manipulation, use of a certain idea that will serve pragmatically the needs of the Soviet Union. When you check the anti-Nazi leaflets in this area, to the best of my knowledge, uh, from, from the socialists, not a single one, not a single one refers to the extermination. Not a single one. The only ones who partly refer to the extermination are leaflets which were not produced by the underground but which were dropped by the RAF and allegedly appear as produced by the local underground. See? But the, originally these were produced by the, by the intelligence, by, American, by, by the British intelligence in London, dropped from, from, from the air and circulated among the masses. But they were not produced. And all what I'm talking here is, is totally irrelevant for occupied Europe. It's a different story. What I'm talking here is about the exile uh, organizations in the West. What happens there? And things that are irrelevant for the Soviet Union or are irrelevant for occupied Paris become irrelevant in England and in Mexico and in the United States, which is to mobilize the Jewish communities for the Second Front to help Stalin win Win, 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 uh, win the war. You have mentioned after um, talking about Martin Buber and uh, fascination with Hitler that uh, brief remark the Jewish bourgeoisie in Austria, France and other countries supported fascism. Yeah. Now I think, I, I think this needs a little bit more of uh, precision. They say, not, this is not what I say, this is what they say, okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I misunderstood it, yeah. but of course, I don't know what the Jewish bourgeoisie is, but if we talk about the Jewish communities, 
Uh, of course, the Austrian Jewish community, community supported the Shushnik regime, but in principle, not out of love for the semi-fascist regime, but because especially from the viewpoint of 1937 and 1938, it was the only alternative to the Nazi takeover, at least from the viewpoint of the Jewish community. So uh, fascism and fascism, uh, we have also the phenomenon of an anti-Nazi fascism, like the Greek Metaxas regime or the Austrian Shushnik regime. And the Jewish perception of this kind of fascism was, of course, a very different one. Yeah, thank you very much. Again, it's very good that we have questions, because sometimes it helps to clarify things that I may not have uh, express myself well. This is what, when when this, uh, I was uh, I was referring to an article that appears in either the Gegen Angriff or the Unser Zeit. It's one of the communist uh, publications of uh, 1934. And when he wants to say, uh, listen, it's not only the Jews of the Zentralverein who get organized and, and, and create institutions under the Nazis, but it's also in other countries. Then he says, look at Austria, it's also there. The Jewish bourgeoisie, they support the, the, the Ständestaat, they support the fascist regime, and, and so on. This is what they say. So this is clear. What I say about this, that's a different story. You see, I, I, I guess I also have my, my opinions on the political orientations of, of, of Jews in, in, the, in the 19th and 20th century and uh, whether all Jews are liberals, because Jews must be liberals as a, uh, as a I don't know, as some sort of axiomatic uh, principle, uh, or uh, Jews uh, are not necessarily liberals when, uh, when conditions uh, are, are not the, uh, the best for them to be liberals. But that, this is what I think, and this is not the topic of my, my lecture. You described in a very uh, impressive way the um, development of discussion in, in, in free Europe. Uh, and the ideological, the ideologies were developed there. I would be interested to know what, uh, how did uh, the Jewish official Jewish organizations on the spot react? For example, the Board of Deputies. There's certainly, there were certainly discussions going on there. How did they relate uh, to this uh, uh, political discussion among exiles? And did they try to influence it? What were the contacts? I mean, that would be an interesting question. It is indeed an interesting question, but the time will not allow me to expand on that. And again, you have to go country by country. Basically, I mean, if you, if you want to say, OK, give me the gist. The gist is the Jewish organizations detested these, these, these people. They never liked the, the German exiles. The, there was almost no case in which you find a common front of uh, exiles and Jewish organizations in any political activity. And uh, the reason is, is very simple. Uh, most of the exiles, with, a, with, with a very few exceptions, but most of the exiles believed in das andere Deutschland, in das andere Österreich, in das andere etc. Which means what's happening now in, in Germany is that a, a bunch of, of, of Nazis, of criminals, uh, are now controlling a mass of people who are opposed to the regime. And what can you do in a regime of terror you, 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 you cannot oppose it. This is the basic idea of das andere Deutschland. And, uh, and this view was <coughs> utterly rejected by the Jews. They never believed that there is das andere Deutschland. They said not a single proletarian lift his finger to protect Jews from the protections. There is no indication that there is an andere Deutschland. All, all indication is that Hitler represents the views and the needs and, and the wishes of 60 million Germans, and, and, and uh, what, uh, 15 million Austrians, or how many were there, were, were there at the time? And, 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 and to speak about us under Deutschland is propaganda. And therefore, as long as these, these Germans will continue with this uh, slogan of das andere Deutschland, we are not going to support them. And uh, das andere Deutschland, actually, in, in the 40s, 
begun with, uh, with uh, the plans. What are we going to in the Nachkriegsdeutschland? We are going to build this, we are going to build that. And the Jewish organizations told them, before you start rebuilding, tell me, what's your, what, what, what about Treblinka? What about Auschwitz? What about Belgium? Before you speak <coughs> about the rebuilding of. So th this is more or less the relations. There is always an attempt of these organizations to go to the Jewish community. Don't forget also that there is a large number of Jews, or let me put it this way, people of Jewish origin in these organizations. They don't see themselves as Jews, but they are Jewish in their And, uh, and they, they, they are attempts to, to go into the Jewish and, 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 and to mobilize the Jewish community for their interests, as I try to show. But the Jews are very, very, very reluctant in the community. When it comes to the leadership of the community, when it comes to the leadership of the community, this is, this is already different. Uh, the leadership of the community has to act uh, with, with the principle of, uh, who was it? Uh, Domitianus, I think, right? Pecuniam non oli. What can you do? If you need the support of study, then, then you must get also the support of, of these people. And this is why people like Zedek Brodetsky, who at the time was, the, you were asking about the, the Board of Deputies, uh, or as I said earlier, uh, Stephen Wise. They say, okay, we'll do some things with them. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do some common activities with, with, with these Germans, not because we like them, but because we need that uh, uh, political interests are much more important than what we personally feel about them. But when, when you read, the, 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 especially the, the German Jewish uh, magazines and newspapers all over the world, from, there, is, there is one, the Jüdische Wochenschau, that appears in Buenos Aires. They, they hate these people. They, they cannot stand them. Every time they come up with, with, with this argument, stop talking about, about about the reconstruction of Germany, it's talked talk about the, the Dasandre, but there is no such a thing. And, and it's, it's simply a, a, a defamation of the Jews to participate, for, for a Jew to participate in the, in the endeavors of these organizations. If we have a few moments left, I would like you to uh, at least explore and outline the attitudes of the German, cons German and Austrian conservatives in exile. And if you know anything about it. it, it to explore the? Uh, attitudes of the German and Austrian conservatives oh. in exile. And if you know anything about it, uh, even on the radical right, such as the Black Front. Straße. Straße. Um, the, the conservatives in exiles, the, the, the conservative exiles are not really surprising. So when I write this in book form, so this will be a boring chapter. <laughs> I must include them because Peter Black will say, where are the conservatives? <laughs> they also exist. But if you expect something interesting, they'll say, uh, th they have the same views that preceded the war, continue also, also then. Uh, and not only, not only the non-Jews, also the Jews continue with these views. For example, there is a correspondence between Scherz, the, the father, <laughs> to, uh, with, with these conservative circles. And what does Scherz, the Jew, write in 1940? He's in Sweden at the time and says, after the war, what are we going to do? Okay, uh, first of all, we will make a numerous numerous clauses for Jews. Because why, why do we need so many intellectuals? I mean, the, the problem of anti-Semitism is the, 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 the hyper-intellectuality of the Jews and the number of, of Jews that are intellectuals. Like, like the, the Hans Jäger was saying. So he's adopting these views. If we have more people who grow potatoes and less people who are doctors and lawyers, then the problem of anti-Semitism will, will, will disappear. B, return of the Jews. Of course return, but with, uh, with, uh, with the limit. I mean, not everybody will return. We have to consider, do we need him to return? Because again, the number of Jews is also a problem that creates anti-Semitism. The, the, the surrounding society will accept Jews 
up to a point. I mean, there is a number that is digestible. More than that, it, it, you need al So th This is what the, the, the society, how the society looks at the Jewish question. And this is written more or less by, by in, in these words, by, by, by Schertz. When you get, and, and, the, and, and the others, sometimes you have uh, conservatives who are decent human beings, but they formulate it in this way. You remember Rauschnick, right? Hermann Rauschnick, one of the famous opposers to the regime uh, from the right. He says the following. Um, he says, and again, it, in, in, in the correspondence, it's not in his books. If you read the uh, Hitler Speaks or, or, or uh, the, 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 the Revolution, what's the name? The Nihilismus, there you don't find it. But in his correspondence, he says this, <coughs> that the Jews uh, will return. We cannot, for, I mean, we live in the 20th century. And, and uh, we cannot uh, block the, the return to, 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 to the country. And, uh, but what will we do? How can we prevent the return of the Weimar Zeit? With all the problems of Weimar, the Jews were, were in the front of everything. I mean, gay liberation movement, Hirschfeld was there. <laughs> the Jews are in the front of everything. How can we, can we prevent this? And then he says, we can prevent it by telling the Jews to be more tactful. If they realize that people don't like what they do, so what, how should you behave when you know that people don't like what you do? Don't do it. This is the, this is the conception. And this is what Rauschen writes. We will talk with the leaders of the Jewish community and tell them, don't do things that might be considered by the society as offensive. Don't push yourself where you're unwanted. And this is the Rauschnick. This is the Rauschnick view. Yeah? It reminds me, uh, as someone was writing here, and I think it was in Vienna, a representative of the church that was telling the Jews, listen, by your behavior, you don't allow me to be a good Christian. <laughs> because a good Christian must love. Christianity is the religion of love. Even love your enemy. But in the moment that you push yourself, I cannot love you. Yeah? And I cannot love you, I cannot be a good Christian. Therefore, don't push yourself where you're unwanted, so I can be a good Christian. So this is the logic of people like Kaushni. Strasser is an anti-Semite and remains an anti-Semite. Uh, but uh, he was flirting with the Jewish organizations. Again, we, we come into politics. I'm not interested in Strasser, the individual. We come into politics. He wanted support. He was ostracized by all anti-Nazi organizations. No, nobody wanted to, to, to work with him. And uh, so he went to the Jewish community. He went to the Jewish community here in, here in, in, in Vienna and then in Prague and, uh, and looked for support. And then he, he, uh, he, um, and he gave the, 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 these, these possibilities. Possibility one, after the war, we get rid of Hitler. Possibility one, assimilate. But assimilate under what we, the non-Jews, consider assimilation, which means you do not exist anymore. All these spielerei of Jüdische uh, Staatsbürger, um, um, uh, what's that? Mosaischen Glaubens and all the, the, the Deutsche Staatsbürger und Mosaischen Glaubens, no more. Assimilate means disappear, don't exist. <coughs> this is what possibility one. Possibility two is minority rights. You will be a minority. Europe will be organized in the form of a federation. You will be one of the minorities, but the minority doesn't have the chutzpah to demand to also be general of the, of the, of the, of the army. A minority doesn't have the chutzpah to be a chief justice. A minority cannot have the chutzpah to be prime minister. So you'll be a minority and you'll have minority rights. A university, okay, a center for the study of Holocaust, no problem. But not more than that. And the third, the third is Palestine. And, and, and it's not clear to me what he preferred of these three, right? Because why do I say it's not clear? You would say Palestine is obviously the best. 
because in other writings, when he writes, not to the Jewish community, when he offers them these three alternatives, but when he writes to his brother, he believes in the world Jewish conspiracy. So he writes about the Jewish Weltverschwörung, and the basis of a Jewish Weltverschwörung will be in Palestine. So to tell them go to Palestine is not necessarily the best option because this will strengthen the, the basis of the world Jewish conspiracy. That, that, that's Strasser. Okay, Mr. Martin, tell me, is it common, uh, is this not Fragen? Uh, here, Good, kurze, kurze Frage. Sure. I don't know if you have seen it before, but... Oh, sorry, I'm uh, seeing no, it. No, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay, I speak English as well, John. No, the, uh, uh, you, know, the, you know, of course, and this is something I lived through, the Austrian center in Austria, the free Austrian movement, which was communist controlled. And a few years ago, some British historians wrote a book about the Austrian center, and it contained the marvelous sentence, some, some, some historian wrote that, that the greatest problem of the leaders of the, uh, of the Austrian center, the communist leaders of the Austrian center, between August 1939 and June 1941, was to convince Austrian Jews, mainly young Austrian Jews, that it was now their duty to the party to be allies of Hitler. Sure. They just didn't want to be allies of Hitler. Sure, this is, I mean, this is not only here, you know, it's a problem all over. I, I, when, I, when I read the documents of the time, I, I, I I, I remember reading on, on, on Chile that you have communists and Nazis demonstrating together in the streets of Santiago, Heil Stalin and Heil Hitler. You know, when, when, you, are a mem when a, you are a Jew and a member of, of the Communist Party and you see this, it, it's a dissonance that, that it's really unbearable. I mean, you must be very, very strong dogmatically, uh, strong to, 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 to resist the temptation not to leave in, in such a case. A Viennese left-wing historian called Heli Weimann, who may be in this room, uh, wrote, in a, uh, wrote in a book about emigration to Britain that one of the leaders of the Free Austrian Movement, she told me his name years later, was hauled before his controller, his minder, of the British Communist Party, that it has come to his ears that he doesn't seem to understand the party line, which is to be neutral in this imperialist war between Britain and Germany, and he then told him some terrible things about the new Prime Minister Winston Churchill, what he had done in the general strike 14 years ago, to which that man said that he would now practice communist self-criticism. And he will admit that he is not neutral in this imperialist war between Hitler and Churchill, but with all his heart, he hoped that Churchill would win and Hitler would lose. He wasn't neutral at all, but fortunately for him, a few months later, he was on the right side again. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.